I think, to have two such important people, both to the crafts, to the textile world, and to our international friendship, to be here together to speak. Alejandro de Avila Bloomberg is here from Oaxaca. He is the director of the Ethnobotanical Garden in Oaxaca and the curator of the Museo Textil. So he has a very deep knowledge of textile, of fiber, of cochinilla, <coughs> uh, astounding knowledge. And our second speaker today is Jim Bassler. And there he is. <laughs> And Jim lives in Palm Springs. No, Jim Bassler <laughs> is, is essential, was essential to the LA Unified School District when he taught there. Then he went on, he went to Oaxaca, which is what we'll be speaking about today. And then he went on to be at UCLA. So, and now he does the most wonderful work. And you'll see Jim's work on the wall across the way. And then the two pieces of pottery that you see there are done by Vera Lee Bassler, who's sitting right next to Jim. And when I started to think about the two episodes of Craft in America called Borders and Neighbors, I went several times to visit the Bassler's. And I heard in no uncertain terms how it had to be told or else it wasn't worth telling. And part of what they said was I had to speak with Alejandro. So it all came together nicely. And I'm very proud to be able to introduce them today. And they have a lot to tell you. So please, gentlemen. Good afternoon. It's an honor to be here. Uh, Jim has asked me to go first. So what I thought I would do this afternoon is to give you a sense of how the conversation began. And it began in 1976 in Oaxaca, where I live and where I met Vera Lee and Jim in the most interesting and the most culturally and biologically varied region in Mexico. And of course, I'm not biased. This is the <laughs> truth. This is by far, it has been shown to be the case. We see it where Mexico gets narrow, where the North American continent uh, narrows down. And we have the influence of both the Gulf of Mexico and the Pacific at hand. And this has shaped a unique environment in which culture has flourished. And I would like to tell you a little bit as an introduction to our ongoing conversation with Verily and Jim. This is the city of Oaxaca where I met them, the capital city, which sits at the confluence of three arms, a narrow valley nested in a very mountainous region with great variation in climate, in rainfall, in vegetation, and in kinds of plants and animals. And I met Vera Lee and Jim at this very house, which is my family's home. This is where my great-great-grandfather started uh, his descent. And I say his descent because he had a number of wives and <laughs> dozens of children. And we saw this house as our family home, as the home where we came from. It's two blocks away from the main square of Oaxaca. Today, it is a gallery that you see right there, which is an embarrassment to me. I do not like what has happened. But in that same location where that gallery is today was a gallery owned by a grand uncle of mine where I met Jim and Vera Lee in 1976, quite a long time ago. <laughs> this uh, place, in addition to having the gallery, in the patios had a weaving workshop that my granduncle had started in the 1940s. And I spent the summer of 1976 there learning to weave. I was interested in the artistic traditions of Mexico, and I took on an apprenticeship to learn to weave cotton on a thread loom, the loom introduced by the Spaniards in the 16th century. And as you can tell, if any of you are weavers in the audience, this is a trail loom where the pattern is controlled by the heddle. It's a four harness loom, and you get quite a bit of variation in the patterns that you can produce simply by the way that the warp threads are set up. Anyway, that was the mission that I had for that summer since I had been working at my uh, grand uncle's gallery for a long time, and I had to learn to weave. And in the process of weaving, I got back 
to my family roots because in the tradition of our family, our great grandmothers on both sides of the family were weavers. And this bag I inherited from my family roots. This, was, this, gift, uh, this had been given to me when I turned 11 years old by my grandmother when she realized that I had an interest in Mexican things. She gave me this bag. <coughs> this bag belonged to the man you see in the photograph. His name was Florencio de Avila. Lencho, he was known affectionately. Lencho was my grandfather's brother who died young. He died tragically. He was a very gifted horse rider and he loved horse races. But the telegraph line had recently been installed and the horse he was riding went amok and threw him against the pole of the telegraph lines. He survived the accident, but he was neurologically very impaired and he died in my grandparents' home. So my grandmother kept this bag as a memento of him. He kept his love letters. He was about to be married, and he kept his love letters in this bag, so she kept it lovingly in his memory. And when she saw that I liked Mexican things, she gave it to me. And this was my introduction to textiles. This is what got me hooked on textiles, if you will. It's a double weave. It's a very complicated technique. It is a wool and cotton combined. So I have a family background in textiles, and I went to Oaxaca to learn the techniques. And furthermore, Oaxaca was of particular interest, although I didn't know it at the time, neither did Jim. But I want to share this with us because I think it's a preamble to what Vera Lee and Jim have done in Oaxaca. Within the Valley of Oaxaca, there is this volcanic formation. We call it Guilana Kitz, which means the white cliff in Zapotec. In this cliff, there are a series of caves and rock shelters. And they are very dry because the volcanic rock does not allow moisture to seep through. In these dry conditions, we have found, archaeologists have found, 10,000-year-old remains that are perfectly well preserved including the earliest evidence for cultivation of plants in the Western Hemisphere and the earliest textiles in Mesoamerica. This is a piece of netting that seems to date back the earliest. It probably is agave fiber, although we don't know for sure because nobody has taken it to the laboratory. But the same kind of textile continues to be made today. These are the bags that are produced for people to take their lunch to their work, to the maize field. The plant that probably yielded the fiber for this bag, for the earliest textiles that we know of in this part of the world, is probably agave, the century plant. It is misnamed in English because it doesn't live to be a century, but that's what it was called. And this will serve to me as a transition to talk about two very important people that Vera Lee and Jim met in Oaxaca. I didn't have the honor of meeting them. I was too young, but they did. And they have told me about them. The first person is this gentleman that you see, whose name colloquially in Oaxaca was Don Tomas. He was Thomas McDougall, a Scotsman, who had migrated to the East Coast. He worked for a nursery someplace in New England. He saved his money, and every year he came down for several months to Oaxaca. And he traveled all over, mostly by foot, and he gathered plants and animals. He pressed plant specimens. He gathered also animal specimens, which he sent to the American Museum of Natural History in New York and also to the National University in Mexico. There are scores of species, both of plants and of animals, that he brought back, and many of them are named in his honor. Magdugali. You may know a plant that I have seen in gardens here in LA. Furcrea Magdugali, I don't know a common English name for it. It's a beautiful plant, very stately, very majestic, that was named in his honor. Anyway, Thomas McDougall did fantastic work, both in terms of getting to know the flora and fauna of Oaxaca and making it known to experts in the uh, National University of Mexico and here in the United States, but also he did ethnographic work. He was interested in the traditions of the people among whom he was working, and he recorded a tradition 
that was vanishing in many cases. And I don't just refer to material <coughs> traditions, not just the production of people, be it textiles or pottery or basketry or wood carving, but he also recorded what people remembered and what people had memorized. Among other jewels that he left us, he recorded a very elaborate ritual on cochineal, and it's the only ceremony that we know of that involved the production of the major dye that has been so important in the history of Oaxaca. But I will not develop on uh, cochineal. Let me just give you a sense of what he did by giving you a few images of the area that he discovered. He was the first person to come to realize that in the core of Middle America, right on the Isthmus of Tehuantepec, is a huge, pristine wilderness, hundreds of thousands of hectares of undisturbed primary forest, both tropical rainforest, like you see here. These are old photographs, so they're a little bit blurry, but they're historic and also cloud forest, and even on into pine and oak forest at higher, higher altitudes. He reported for the first time red macaws in this region, which were thought to be restricted to areas much further south. He found the crested guan, a bird that is legendary, that is unique to southernmost Mexico and Guatemala, and only there. And even the resplendent quetzal, the most beautiful bird of the Americas. He saw it in the wilderness right there. His work was fantastic. He uncovered a New Mexico for us, including its traditions that go back for centuries. And he was collaborating with indigenous men who he had befriended, and foremost among them, also very well known to Vera Lee and Jim, was Francisco Ortega, whom we knew as Chico Ortega. Chico as a a affectionate term for Francisco. Chico Ortega was not only leading Don Tomás MacDougall into the remote areas of Oaxaca, but he was collaborating with the leading anthropologists of the time. Here you see the gentleman uh, who is presenting his credentials to community elders. He is the legendary anthropologist Robert Weitlaner, who was an Austrian a mining engineer who came to Mexico, fell in love with Mexico, and forgot about mines, and became the leading anthropologist in Mexico, starting in the 1920s. Chico collaborated extensively with Robert Weitlaner, and he collaborated with his daughter. It's Irmgard, who was my mentor. She was my textile teacher, scholar, and dear friend. And Irmgard went throughout Oaxaca, she went all over uh, the mountainous areas, oftentimes with Don Tomás, and if not with Don Tomás, with Chico Ortega. And I included this photograph not only because I think it's a very beautiful testament of how good rapport she had with people, but Vera Lee and Jim bequested to our textile museum a wipil just like this. <laughs> so Chico Ortega, was crucial in documenting what was dying out under their eyes, literally, and which Vera Lee and Jim got to see the very end. They got to interview some of these weavers. They got to see some of what they had produced in the 1970s. But the 80s and 90s, this was gone. There was nothing more left. The elderly people had died. And just to give you an example, with Chico Ortega, Irmgard was able to document the finest weaving tradition in Mesoamerica of the last 100 years. This is the community of San Bartolo Yautepec in the southern mountains of Oaxaca. This is one lady who had kept a few garments. She no longer wore them, but she knew how they were worn, and she is modeling them for Irmgard. Here's the garment, a fantastic huipil. This is hand-spun cotton very, very finely spun, very finely spun, incredibly fine material. And the supplementary wefts, brocading, if you will, are silk, silk produced in Oaxaca. And I included this particular photo, again, because of Jim's work. That piece that you have right there, 
those details are exactly the same material as this. This is silk that is raised traditionally in Oaxaca. It was brought by the Europeans in the 1500s and Oaxaca became the center of production in the Americas of silk and it continues to produce, there's an uninterrupted tradition of silk. And before the Europeans introduced it, we have reason to believe that people were gathering wild silk from oaks. There is one particular species of moth that builds communal nests and the silk can be used. And I found one person in my own work in the 1980s, uh, soon after uh, Chico Ortega uh, had done most of his work with his collaborators. And it turned out, indeed, it was the wild silk. So I think silk goes back to before European times. Anyway, coming back to this, this is not cochineal dyed silk. This is silk dyed with fuchsin, a synthetic dye. But Vera Lee and Jim really liked this material. And Jim kept this silk and used it for that particular silk. How long had you kept that silk, Jim? Uh, bought it in 1970. But she kept, she, she kept on spinning it at the corner of Mina and J.P. Garcia, right near Nicodemus' shop. She was right next door. And I said, what do you do with this? And she looked like she was 60 or 70. She says, well, my mother weaves them into rebosos. So. So we have started the renewed dialogue, the conversation. I have a few more photographs I would like to show you before we look at Jim's images and carry on with the conversation. I just want to uh, lead into collaborations that have started in Oaxaca, thanks to the inspiration of Vera Lee and Jim, and here is one of them. This is a photograph taken again by Irmgard of another tradition that was already dead by the time she went there. This photograph was taken in the 1950s in the town of San Pedro Atoyac on the coast, the Pacific coast of Oaxaca. And the lady is wearing a skirt that she had received as a gift from her husband. I interviewed this lady in the 1980s and she told me the story. She told me, my husband loved me dearly and he had cattle. So he sold part of his herd to buy these skirts for me. These were woven specially for me, and I kept them, and I kept them for many years until these foreigners interested in all things came and bought them for me. But this is what these skirts look like. They are the most elaborate skirts of any tradition in Mesoamerica, more complex in their weaving structure, I dare say, than any Guatemalan pieces, although there are some very interesting Guatemalan skirts. And nobody knew how to do this anymore. This technique was totally lost. But a weaver in the neighboring town, the previous skirt was woven in the town of San Pedro Tututepec. And there is a person from San Pedro Tututepec who I wish were here. His name is Federico Jimenez. Some of you may know him. He's a legend here in LA. Federico is from Tututepec. And he told me about this weaving tradition and he confirmed what the Cordries, if you know that book, had heard that the town authorities in the early part of last century, because they were non-indigenous, they were mestizo, they had forced the indigenous population to forget about indigenous costume and to forget about indigenous weaving. And they went so far as to force people to bring to the plaza their garments and they burnt them. Talk about cultural violence. So this was forcefully extirpated. It was forcefully destroyed. This tradition was destroyed. And so in Tututepec, nobody weaves anymore. But in the neighboring town of Pinotepa Don Luis, Bonfilia, who knew how to weave the Pinotepa skirt, wanted to learn the, how to do the Tututepec skirt but she couldn't figure out how it was done because she had no example to follow. And so we sat down and I showed her how. <coughs> and it, it was hard for me to explain, so I ended up 
sitting down at her loom and I showed her how this was done. It's a warp float weave where both sets of the warp are made to float on alternate uh, sheds and the result is a design with more contrast. And now Bonfilia is doing it. We have started a further collaboration which involves Jim with feather work, another technique that had died out. In this case, it had died, died, it had died out in the 1700s. We managed to acquire a fragment, one of the few surviving examples, with the down, down was spun. And like the South American featherwork textiles, which are quite well known, and there are numerous examples from the archaeological sites in Peru, on the coast of Peru, in the case of Mesoamerica, they were using down, they were spinning it with cotton, and part of that thread was dyed, it was colored with cochineal, with indigo, with other materials. And so we took on the task of reproducing this, first of achieving the feathered thread, and then how to use it in weaving. And I have had the fortune of collaborating with a very talented young man by the name of Noé Pinzon. Here we are working together. We're producing a sample. This was the first project just to experiment with the technique. And this is our second piece, which Jim saw. And Jim was asking me about this piece. We are using silk, both for the warp and the weft and we are adding the uh, feathered thread as a supplementary weft. Here is the almost finished piece. And Noé was quite pleased when he finished. He's admiring his finished work. But James said, I don't see a rhythm here. What is your count? Do we call this paño para recibir a una criatura al nacer, cloth to welcome a baby when it is born. And there's a long story to this, but I won't go into that. <laughs> Jim was asking, how, how, how did you conceive of this pattern? What's going on here? And to respond to Jim, a year later, here, Jim, I brought my graph. <laughs> Here's my graph. The Bs are the white feather, the C is the coyuche, the A is the silk tie with indigo, and then the feathers, the feathered threads, are with colored dots. There is a pattern. There is a rhythm. <laughs> but we like to do things complex. You didn't throw dice. No, I did not throw dice. I did not throw dice. Because I, I do that. <laughs> <laughs> Here's the finished piece. And after oh, this piece, a yeah, you, you can see it. There is a, there is a rhythm, but it, it reverses. It's, it's more, we like to convolute things, Apalil in Oaxaca. There's a saying, in Spanish, in Oaxaca, hasta el queso lo enredan. In Oaxaca, even cheese is made into a convolute because the cheese is uh, prepared in strands and then it's wrapped up. It's what we call quesillo. Here's a piece we uh, did after the show where these two pieces that are hanging on the wall, this one here and this one over here, George Washington, were exhibited along with the piece that I just showed. So we shared space and we were honored that Jim made these two pieces specifically for this exhibit. This last one that I'm showing you was not done for this exhibit. This one we did since. And this one we started weaving just as when it appeared that the elections in the United States might not be good for Mexico. So we called it La Vida de Cuadritos, Life in Little Squares. This is a metaphor in vernacular Mexican Spanish for when life gets complicated and difficult and challenging. And I want to end my presentation <laughs> by saying that in the face of the obsessive and aggressive campaign of this man against Mexico, we are heartwarmed when somebody like Jim does 
what we did over here. This piece for us is very symbolic. This is the double-headed birth. This is the eagle of empire. But he has subverted it, and he has subverted it twice. He subverted it first by adding ducks' beaks instead of the eagle, because conventionally it's the double-headed eagle of the Habsburgs, who were the rulers of Spain when Mexico City fell, when Hernán Cortés arrived in Mexico. But he has subverted that emblem of empire by adding the duck bills, and he further subverted it. And this he added after the US elections. <laughs> These yellow feathers are because of the man that you see right here. I think, I think Jim deserves a, a, a big clap. In the face of what is happening in the United States, Mexico, I would like to think, takes heart in its roots. We take heart in our dignity. We take heart in the art of common people. And for us, it's an honor that somebody of the stature of Vera Lee and Jim have taken it into their life. They got to see the talent, the spontaneity, the playfulness, and also the deep respect of how people do their work. And they were open to that, and they grew in their own careers. And we feel honored that they took part of the legacy of Mexico into their own work. And with this, I would like to hand on the microphone to Jim. Very briefly, before I um, show you any images, uh, I know most of you here. I just want to remind you, uh, some of you might remember the 50s, the 60s, and the 70s. Some of you, Daniel, won't. Uh, and uh, our, our arriving at an art-centered kind of life didn't happen right away. I was drafted in the army in 1950, 52, 53, and sent to Germany as an occupation force rather than being sent to um, Korea. And I was able to witness um, people putting their lives together, particularly in Italy and of course in Germany and of course in England and how they made objects that helped them survive. I, was I found I was fascinated with how things are put together. And I had tried, when I graduated from high school, Santa Monica High School, to be an art major. But the counselor at Santa Monica High School and I think there are probably still a lot of counselors in our country, said there isn't such a thing as art. Uh, find something else. She also told me when I took a ceramic class in high school, she said, this will not look good on your record. <laughs> so you do begin to wonder about certain attitudes. And this woman had gray hair and I knew she must be wise. <laughs> and so I became a sociologist and then was drafted. I enjoyed living in Europe so much, I was able to find ways of living in Europe until 1960. I got a job with Douglas Aircraft Company. On my way home, I decided to go the long route through India, through Indonesia, and <clears throat> Japan. Actually, I got into China, too, the new territories. And again, I saw this amazing ability of indigenous people, particularly in India, who the indigenous people were the ones who dressed the people, dressed. It was from them that you had an image of India. And Indonesia was the same way. And I wondered, is there anything like that in the United States? 
I came back and in 1960 enrolled in an art department that had always been there. And it was at that particular time I met Verily. Verily had been a hostess for TWA. <laughs> Think, this was pre-JET. When you sat someone down in their seat, you were going to feed them breakfast, lunch, and dinner. And then maybe by then be over Nebraska, I don't know. <laughs> and so she also came back searching for something, searching for something that would give a meaningful life. And that's how we met. And she was a little bit ahead of me. She came back late 50s. I wasn't there till 60s. And she graduated from the arts education program at UCLA that was excellent. And she got a plum job at Uni High teaching ceramics. I was a year later, and I got a really good job at Emerson Junior High in Westwood teaching ceramics. We finally, because my students melted into her students, uh, we met, we, we married in 1965. In 1967, the Anthropological Museum had opened up in uh, Mexico City, and in our Volkswagen, we drove down to see it. <coughs> in the museum was a whole section dedicated to Oaxaca, which we were mispronouncing. Actually, Burley was better at it than I was. I looked on a map, and it was only three inches below Mexico City <laughs> on a very curvy line. And I said, in the afternoon, let's go there. Let's drive down there. Uh, we'll have a late dinner. <laughs> it uh, took us 14 hours. And uh, that was in 1967 was our introduction to Oaxaca. This, I think, is, tells the history of Mexico. <laughs> um, in the 1500s, they were invaded by Europe, by Spain. And as a result, you have Jesus and Catholicism. And actually, in the 1800s, France came in and did the same thing. And Alejandro can probably think of a number of invasions that happened. Uh, but then you've got that insidious kind of invasion from a capitalist country that's right next door to you who brings you Pepsi. <laughs> and one of the things that I found in those early days in seeing Oaxaca was it was so isolated from the rest of the world that it helped save it because people just didn't want to drive that drive that we went, even though it had an airport. And so that saved a little bit. The objects that I was most interested in is the survival objects that people made. And this is in from market, and it almost looks like a Ruth Asawa piece. It's the same kind of construction that Alejandro showed. If you're going to market, you've got to figure out how to either take something to market or how to take it home if you bought it in market. And the, in, the ingenious way that people figured things out. I love this one, the, the chicken hotel. Um, <laughs> if this were in Los Angeles, perhaps there would be a psychiatrist in Beverly Hills that would teach the chickens how to walk in a line to where they had to go. <laughs> But that's not the case in Oaxaca, and they made this wonderful kind of a container. I always wanted to ask the guy, but my Spanish wasn't good enough, if you pull one out and don't like the rest of it, can you put it back in, or is it it's yours to have and to hold? This one is one of my very favorites. This is how to get four turkeys to market. And, and it's all textile art. Uh, how do you put things together? M amazing kind of constructions. 
This is one of my very favorites also, how the same kind of packaging can deal with the, with the person themselves. That is, in a survival, it begins to rain, how do you make a raincoat? Here, here a woman had a perfect solution. And then of course, these are the most obvious things, when they finally got much more sophisticated and began to plate palm leaves and also make ceramics. So that has to do with containers that amaze me. This is from Putla. Putla was a market on Sunday that we would take our summer girls to, which I'll get into later on. And what I like, what, what I want to show you here first of all, is these wonderful kind of, here's packaging. If you're a potter, and it's probably the woman is the potter, it's the man who has to carry them to market. And this is the kind of package he makes for that. This is mid-1970s. Prior to the plastic bowls on the head, they used to have gourds on their head. But plastic began to appear little by little by little into the marketplace. And then all of a sudden, a whole art form goes away because all of a sudden it's plastic is easier. You go to market, you're there all day. You have to drink, you have to eat your food. You don't go home at night. And so here this Trike woman has plastic on her head. This is a group in the same market of Putla, where that was the first time I'd ever seen plastic baskets just like the one. This is a palm basket. And they, the Trikes were sort of walking around them, staring at them and pointing at them. They weren't sure they wanted to buy them yet. It was just this new product on the market. And of course, it, it represents uh, progress, I guess. And this is also probably one of my favorite pictures. This is with the summer program. One of our summer girls brought down a Polaroid camera. And instead of taking pictures of people and going away with the picture in the camera, she was able to take the pictures and hand it to the young girl and say, Here's, this is yours. So these girls here are looking at themselves and they're with young girls from New York, Chicago, California. And there's this sort of wonderful kind of energy going on between them. The looms I was introduced to was, this is from Santo Tomas, and it's a rigid heddle loom where you just go up and down, up and down. It's a backstrap, but not in the true sense. And, uh, but it's a, a wonderful loom to learn on. This is in Yal Yalala. There's a young lady here, Molly, a middle-aged middle young lady. <laughs> who at age 12, or no, 14, was on a 14-hour bus ride to get to Yalala, where we spent the night and then came home the next day. And th it's rather unusual to see this backstrap because usually the women sit. But here, it, I love the, the photograph because it actually shows how it works. You need tension on a loom, you lean back, you go forward, you lean back. And what she's doing is weaving a segment of her huipil. And of course, this is from Teotihuacan de Valle, the treadle loom that the Spanish brought. In that, of course, men do, at that particular time, did all the weaving. Uh, we're going to take a slight detour here. A lot of, pe a lot of weavers in Teotihuacan made a lot of money. And it was very lucrative for them. This is the Montagna family that we would go to quite often. And they were so proud of the money that they made that they built this Bel Air kitchen. <laughs> <laughs> and here she is standing so proudly in the kitchen with the table and all that. Right after I took the picture, she said, do you want a, tor a hot tortilla? We said, sure, because we we're with a group and they're all trying to decide. And so she goes around the wall into her kitchen. 
this is her kitchen. I don't know what the other one was used for. <laughs> and, and here she was so much happier. The, the other picture, she's up there sort of right, you know. Like, uh, so here, that, that's a wonderful kind of example, I think, of what progress can do and not do. Uh, this is in the state of Hidalgo. I try to say it right for Virily. Um, Octopan. We happened on a group of people who live in the town whose job it was to decorate the church. It's done with probably yucca, don't you think? No, it's a, a different plant. It's, it's not yucca, it's, it's no. It's sotol. Sotol, I don't know an English sotol. name for it. Yeah. But all of this is this, and they actually did a weaving on it. The color, where did the color come from? They had pots of paint on the ground from leftover paint from their houses. And a jury was sitting down here, no, don't use that color, use these colors. No, don't put it there, put it up there. And so all of a sudden this absolutely gorgeous, sophisticated kind of uh, entrance to the church for this holiday was uh, put up. Another marvelous, you, you might not remember this, I don't know. We had a man running for president, we, they, we were, Jose Lopez Portillo. And when he was running for president, they had a motorcade coming from the airport to drive into the city. Probably the, uh, the political uh, outfit that was controlling his campaign went through San Antonino and had them make this amazing entrance. These are two doors. This is a highway that they completely shut off. Can you imagine doing that one on the 405? <laughs> Hey, something we could do for Trump. <laughs> anyway, this is the shape of the state of Oaxaca, the seven regions, La Mixteca, the Cañada. And these are all little tiny flowers put up. So when his motorcade came through, the doors were opened up and he was, had his entrance to the city. A absolutely beautiful piece. I want to compare it to this. <laughs> I was lost. I was lost in Dallas, and I thought I was going to the the art museum, and it turned out that I was not at the art museum, but at a Mary Kay Cosmetics uh, function that was just about ready to take off. I got out of the car. I, it was so vile looking. I said, "I've got to get a picture of it." My, my eyes were watering from the chemicals used in the rug that they had just rolled out. And a guy was swearing at me, don't you dare step on that rug, it's for Mary Kay. <laughs> and I thought, so the whole thing was just so shoddy looking and so typical of, of, of a culture without art. You know, it's run by something else. This was in 1967, and it is, they're rebosos, they're of wool, and unfortunately the top is lopped off and the bottom is lopped off. They're poles of the top and bottom because they've washed the wool and now they're letting them dry. And I thought, there's textiles in the environment. That's a pretty good idea. This is 1967, 1977. At UCLA, while teaching there, I gave my students the assignment, I want you to select a spot on campus, UCLA, and introduce textiles to it. And I wanted the textiles to maybe stay up three days, or however long we can before the officials tear them down or something. One group of students got this idea, oh, it was a surface design class, it was a tie, it was dye class, that's what it was. And so the students took the trellis that connects the parking structure off of Sunset 
to North Campus. I would say probably <laughs> 700 to 800 people walk through that space a day, and this is what they do. And now keep in mind, this is before iPhones. We couldn't do that today because so many people would be killed. <laughs> Wandering through, bumping into things. And, but this is before iPhones. And so people, people actually got out of their cars and knew where the sun was. They, they knew the breeze was blowing. They would even have eye contact with someone else. And this stayed up for a month and people were sorry to see it go when we finally started taking it down. There was no malicious anything on it. Just people liked to sort of dodge through. They could look down and see if someone's coming. Some people would run through. So it was, a, it was and it was all based on those textiles in Mitla. Okay, one other way that I was affected by Mexico in my teaching, this is a gigante. These are used all the time, and I think it's a tradition from Europe, is it not? A paper mache, these wonderful figures that dance down the street. Well, I was teaching for uh, this dear friend of mine decided to go to Indonesia, and she invited me up to t take her place at Long Beach State. And so, I was to teach on loom, and then they told me I was to teach off loom. I wasn't so sure I knew what off loom was, but I learned quickly enough. <laughs> uh, the students said one quarter at, during Halloween, uh, why don't you teach us crochet? And uh, I said, finally, I admitted, because I don't know how to crochet. They said, we know how to crochet, give us an assignment. <laughs> well, I got the idea to do a gigante. Uh, this, <laughs> this, that's my wife, Vera Lee. <laughs> Please don't laugh. <laughs> uh, Vera Lee's mother and Vera Lee knew how to crochet. And, and most of the class would help me. I got cheap yarn from Super Yarn Mart, and I was put on the pink stuff. So I did all the pink part and the sisal part, and we made this wonderful mermaid. Um, Edith Wiley, some of you might know who Edith Wiley uh, was the owner of the Egg and I, and then the Craft and Folk Art Museum. She saw what I'd done. She says, Jim, I want you to dance in my uh, Dia de los Muertos parade, three miles. Well, I said, okay, but I didn't think I could dress as a mermaid, and then, and I didn't think, I didn't think Wilshire Boulevard was ready for the, the breasts. So, so here, this, and I don't know where the idea of the fangs came from, but I, I I just wanted to, I wanted to frighten children, I think. <laughs> anyway, so Oaxaca is really directly responsible for all of these. <laughs> anyway, our first trip in 1967, the Galagetza, I spotted the textile right in the front here. And I, I was working on my master's exhibit at UCLA. And I was trying, really looking for some sort of direction. And it looked as though that had been painted with dye after weaving. And I thought, boy, I really like that idea. It was only later in Cord from Cordry's book that I saw the image of it. Here, this woman from Usila is actually painting on, on the fuchsia dye on top of a weaving. So I came up with this piece. And so that was in my master's show, 1968. And it was just simply weaving white silk with synthetics and then having the dye reject or do whatever it had to do. Jim, if I may budge in, it's the same dye over in that piece, the, the fuchsia dye. It's the oh, same oh, dye. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. oh. 
in the silk in the in the um, this is our big trip we we got this offer uh, rather than go on the Peace Corps we sort of created our own Peace Corps and this was our trip many times every six months we had to leave the country and uh, this is our little dog Alice uh, and Megan, I don't know where you are in it, but you. Yeah. <laughs> I, but I, I never had the children on top. They, they were always inside. Anyway, uh, this is how we travel. This is the house we bought, sight unseen. We bought a business. We bought a business of a, a, a two-month program for teenage girls from the United States. Can you imagine in today's world? Can you imagine putting your 14-year-old daughter on an airplane in New York City and saying, bye, honey, we'll see you in two months, and, and somebody's going to pick you up in Mexico City and, and drive you 900,000 miles to a place I can't, you know, and you're going you're gonna to love it, sweetheart. <laughs> anyway, this is the house that we bought. Uh, it's called Casa Panchita now, and that's where we had our program with teenage girls for two months. There are three of our former teenage girls in the audience here, I think, right now. This is Chico, Don Chico. Along with the house, we didn't know this, when we bought the house, we bought a sort of gardener called Don Tomas. McDougall, who tended the, all his plants that he found, he would uh, have them growing in our yard, and, and Chico would come to the house to show his wares and show us. And so we got in the habit, I could drive Don Chico in the Volkswagen to the places he wanted to go. In fact, we went to Don Tomas, no, we went to um, Pino Tepe de Don Luis. Luis. And Chico was not very tall, but he was the one who got out of the car and had to walk into the stream to see how far he would go before we say, I don't think we can drive through here. <laughs> if, if Chico would be like this, I'd say, no, we can't do it. So. And Don Chico was the one who invited us to come to uh, Tehuantepec for um, a celebration in August. I think it's Mary's Day. It's an all women's um, celebration. And our women, our young girls, were all, mostly all, very much feminists. They believed in the kind of thing, and they loved the idea of a celebration of all women. And so the next shot is, oh, we, we, went, we went one year, this is uh, Don Chico's daughter, and they, the first year the girls went, they weren't in costume. They said, come back next year, but come back in costume. So Chico rounded up enough costumes, Tijuana costumes, to clothe all the girls so they could go to the party uh, in the regular, uh, the regal kind of dress. So this is verily uh, on the way to the party. This is Verily with Panchita, and it shows an apron she made for a show that was up here. And then in 2001, we drove the apron down because it's identical to the kind of aprons that Panchita wore. And it's down in the house now. This is the woman that uh, did all the spinning at Mina and J.B. Garcia. And this is the piece that is now at LACMA that I used. All of that white in that piece is um, actually uh, from that woman. And that, of course, is a Ruth Asawa piece, and she was greatly influenced by the basket making of the women of Oaxaca. Uh, not Oaxaca, Mexico City. The Reboso a tie and dye that was ubiquitous. It was worn by everybody. I did 
a rebosso piece. And then in 2001, we went to Tlaquialco Market. This woman is standing at Casa Panchita, but she was wandering around the market in Tlaquiaco with all of those silk cocoons. And I asked her, I said, well, do you have any silk to uh, sell? She says, I don't have it with me, but I'll come to your house tomorrow. It was probably a four hour bus ride for her to go back where she was from and then come to our house. And what I bought, it's one of the things they do is they, it's hand spun silk and it's dipped in fuchsia dye and not rinsed. And so you weave with it, it gets all over your hands, it gets in your nose, it gets all over the place. But then what you do is clamp it up so that it will bleed on itself. And so you have this bleeding of the dye going all over the place. This is another piece I did, uh, a runner shroud sort of thing. I don't want to go into the yantra because you could talk about the yantra. Uh, Claire told me, but all of these runners here, all of these, this is woven silk, but the back side is the print of it. So you've got, you've got something like this. In other words, this was folded onto this. That was made from this. Well, it was actually all wouldn't have been made from that. But anyway, it's a wonderful process to be dealing with. Uh, Verily, learned quite a bit. Uh, living, of course, down there. Here are her hands. Wonderful set of hands she did. We have three daughters, and she decided she would deal with each one of them. And um, Megan, who is here, is, the, is represented on the wall where we forced her into violin lessons for I don't know how many years. <laughs> and you can talk with the other two about what, what problems we did with them. So, The owners of this chair are here tonight, today. This is, she did a series of chairs for a project up in San, in San Pedro and then decided to take the idea of the Nopal and made a Nopal chair. And then she was always worried about the many dogs of Oaxaca who um, would bark at night, all night or had to live on the top of a flat roof and bark at you, and all the homeless dogs. So, uh, and Toledo also had a theme of the dog also. And so here she has her dog nose pot, and this is a close-up of it. She did quite a few of them. Uh, we had, they're also on mugs. And here's her cochineas. The cochineas, she's still working on the, the, the final design of what, what, what it should be, but they, her, here they are going out our breezeway. <laughs> and in October of the Palm Springs Art Museum, Art Council exhibit this year, Verily won the Sculpture Award for these, and she called them danzantes. And they have danzantes, if you don't know, or some stones that are up at Monte Alban. And, but they also have a flavor of the nopal. And so there's this blending of many, many different kind of ideas. Lastly, uh, this is a little crush we put up at the house to uh, celebrate the season. And it sort of represents so many of the wonderful craftspeople that we met um, while we, we stayed down there. And it's been, of course, a very, very rich life for us. Thank you very much. I have not a question, but I have a comment that perhaps can lead us into a conversation and not just 
Vera Lee Jim and I, but the audience, pulling the audience. When you just showed us this sculpture of the danzantes, you mentioned that the danzantes are these sculptures up in Monte Alban. You may have seen the first slide in the images that I put together. That is where the conversation started in 1976. That photo was taken in, in Monte Alban. Los Danzantes has been sort of the, Jor the Rorschach test for not only anthropologists, but art historians and people that are interested in what happened in this part of the world. And I want to share this with you, and I would like to get uh, Jim's response to it. Because I say they have been a Rorschach test because they were originally thought to represent people dancing, and that's why they were given the name Danzantes. But then somebody came up with the idea, no, 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 this is not about dancing. This is a medical treatise. Yeah. Yeah. They are presenting human pathologies here, and it's about ailments of the human body and the distorted, contorted positions are because of arthritis or what have you. And then somebody else looked at them and said, no, 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 you're full of it. This is actually recording the slain enemies of Monte Alban. The rising city-state of Monte Alban is celebrating its victories over its neighboring communities by depicting the slain rulers. That hasn't helped either. The latest is, enlightened audience, this is a rite of passage. And what's supposed to be happening there is young men masturbating publicly because it's part of their coming of age. That hasn't hold very well. <laughs> but I think this is, this is a reflection of what goes on. And when we see art from the past, and when we see contemporary artists from villages or from a studio in New York or in LA, we are projecting our own mind frame, are we not? And our own heart frame, are we not? So perhaps that's a thread we can pick up on. Mm -hmm. I think that when Verily was thinking of the name, it was more of using the name of the Dazantes from Monte Alban but the Nepals had a certain kind of swagger to them, you know, that there was a gesture to them that suggested sort of a pun. Because we're well aware of the fact, well, I remember the explanation of them being operations. And no longer did Don Zante make much sense. Uh, and yet that's the name that sticks with them, so, yeah. But also, in embodying the nopal, perhaps there is also a lead into both the next phase of production of the rally with the cochineal bugs, because the cochineal bugs feed on the nopal cactus, mm -hmm. and that leads into your work with textiles, does it mm -hmm. not? My, my current work is sort of steeped in Peruvian, <laughs> you know, I've sort of moved in that direction lately. You know, one thing, um, we, were, we were in Oaxaca for a month last year, and I wrote, wrote to friends saying that Oaxaca has changed but their transition of changing has really taken into account the interest of people. It seems like, I mean, they get so many people down there now, and yet it seems like the government or who is ever in charge seems to be able to handle the, give the people something to do and to have fun and have it still sort of of the tradition of Oaxaca is what I'm saying. But, it, but it's maybe the electronic imagery on the buildings, that kind of thing, the stories they tell. I think they've been very astute at dealing with, with how many people there are now traveling. 
the number of restaurants on the roof. Uh, that's not the way it was, but it's not that bad, you know? What do you do when plane loads and plane loads of people from all over the world arrive in a tiny little town like that? I imagine your garden. Uh, I know how many people go through there. It's hard to get in, you know? Which leads us into the parallels between Oaxaca, Santa Fe, and other cultural meccas like that, where you have... No, I would not put San Miguel Allende. I'm sorry, but I said I'm not biased, of course. <laughs> but I, <laughs> I would not put San Miguel Allende the same, in the same category. I think the parallel is more with Santa Fe and perhaps Cusco in Peru, where I have never been, and perhaps other cities, perhaps the island of Bali. What am I getting to? You have a place that is, has been isolated for a long time, but it was not truly isolated. And I think this is also an underlying substrate in what we are witnessing from the careers of Vera Lee and Jim. Oaxaca was not isolated in that it was the center of production of a very important commodity that is being honored by the ceramics of Vera Lee. Cochinil account for the fact that you have the third largest city in Mexico at the time, we're talking about the late 1500s, the 1600s, the 1700s, on into the 1800s. It was the third largest city in Mexico, both in terms of population and in terms of e economic activity. And it wasn't because of agriculture, it wasn't because of manufacturing, it was because of cochineal. Cochineal was raised in Oaxaca, it was raised on the nopal cactus, it has a shape like you see in Vera Lee, although Vera Lee has made it much more compelling, <laughs> much more compelling, much more human, I would say. But that insect was domesticated. It is not what nature gives you. Neither is the plant where it is grown, the nopal, as we know it today, with no thorns. That is not what nature gave us. That's the result of human work. And we now know from genetics, as well as other lines of evidence, that southern Mexico was the area where the nopales were domesticated and when the bug was domesticated. And we have in the audience Elena, who has written about this, and she holds a contrarian view because she thinks the Andes were the area where there is archaeological evidence for early history. We won't get into that. but. If you have a site that is the crossroads of trade, where a very important commodity is going all the way to China, to India, to Persia for the rugs, and to Turkey, and to Europe, and it is being used not only in textiles, but also in oil painting, and it's being used in cosmetics, and it is being used in foods, and it's the red that colored the world, as is the title of an exhibit that was held here at the Bowers and in Santa Fe. Oaxaca was the place producing that. Oaxaca was attracting attention because it was the area where that world commodity, the most profitable agricultural product in world trade for over 300 years. That had an impact. And it had an impact that I would again propose we think about and reflect in regard to what we're seeing around us. Oaxaca is unique in Latin America, perhaps in the world, in that over 70% of the land is not federal, it is not private, it is communal. It is collective property, the land, the forest, and the water rights. That is unique, no place else, and sociologists and economists have puzzled. How come? Why in Oaxaca? Why not in the neighboring peninsula of the Yucatan with such an extensive Maya population? 
Why not in Guatemala? Why not in the Andean Highlands? It happened in Oaxaca, and this is something that we have been working on, colleagues and I, because of Cochineo. The Spanish Empire realizes very early on that it cannot produce cochineal the same way that it's producing sugar or the same way it's producing indigo, the same way other commodities were being produced elsewhere in the world. That is, with slave labor, if you had slaves tending to the cactus and to the insect, all your profits went into feeding the slaves, into keeping your workforce alive. So the empire realizes very soon the way to make a profit out of cochineal is grant land to the communities, enforce their rights to land, to the forest so that they meet their energy needs, to the water so that they can irrigate their <coughs> milpa, their, their maize fields, and extract from them as tribute, as taxes, the surplus of their labor. And that's what happened. And that's why Oaxaca was spared the land encroachment that was rampant in Mexico and <coughs> elsewhere. But it was not altruism. It was not the king of Spain feeling, having fond feelings for Oaxaca. It was in the self-interest. It was the economic profit that was leading that. And we would like to think that the liveliness that Vera Lee and Jim encountered in Oaxaca in the 70s has to do with that fact. And how so? Because the communities are much more sovereign in Oaxaca than in other regions of Mexico and Latin America. Not only do they own the land and the natural resources, but in some cases at least, they have invested in educating their young. And I think if you interview artists alive today in Oaxaca, their, their, their history, how they were shaped, has to do with that root in the community. And I think what we have seen in the beautiful images that Jim has presented to us in the utilitarian, ingenious aspects that he started out with, and then in the more sophisticated uh, baskets and ceramics and weavings like you see hanging in this room, there is that as the substrate. There is that economic history, but there's also that human experience mm -hmm. underlying this. I, I started out saying I'm not biased in favor of Oaxaca. <laughs> <laughs> what do you think, Jim? No, I, I agree. Would anybody like to add? The people who know Oaxaca, the people who have traveled in Latin America? Absolutely, absolutely. You have a comment. You say that so many people are coming to Oaxaca. Where are these people from? And do you think that um, the majority of the people that might be coming from a particular area are influencing Oaxaca in a particular way? I couldn't hear that. <laughs> She's asking whether we know where the people visiting this large influx of visitors that you described 
coming to Oaxaca, do we know where they're coming from and how they are shaping what is happening in the city itself? Well, I think quite a few of them come from Mexico City to get out of that metropolitan kind of thing and to try to perhaps relive a little bit of what they've lost, what the world has lost. And my point is that Oaxaca seems to honestly still kind of represent some of those trades and traditions uh, so they can come to Oaxaca and, and experience something that no longer exists too many other places. Like Santa Fe in a way too, you know, I mean Santa Fe you go there uh, uh, to see something a little bit different and it seems a little bit sort of honest. Uh, I'm sort of amazed at uh, the commercialism of the world today. Uh, uh, <laughs> where, where it leads us, the, the idea, the commercials on television. I, I can hardly handle television anymore because it's just one thing after another after another. And you can walk the streets of Oaxaca and go into a few little shops and there's just something rather beautiful about the way it's displayed. Uh, what, the, what they're presenting to you seems sort of honest, as, a, as an honest kind of activity I'm doing and uh, presenting for, to you kind of thing. I don't see a whole lot of that up here. Uh, but then I never shop. <laughs> <laughs> Before, before taking another question, I would like to share with you our own experience at the Botanical Garden. We keep track of where visitors come from. And if the Botanical Garden is a reliable sample of people coming to Oaxaca, or visiting cultural places, I should say, it breaks down three thirds. One third of our visitors are from Oaxaca. One third is Mexican nationals from Mexico City, but also from Monterrey, from Guadalajara, from other places. And one third is foreigners. And not just Americans, but we're, growing, we're getting a growing influx of Japanese and Chinese, along with Europeans. For us, that's a good balance. It just happens to break that way in our statistics. I cannot claim that we have a representative sample, but the, tra the, the, tr the, the track keeping that we have done seems to indicate that. And going back to Elena's comment, yes, very much so. It has been a marketing strategy to claim that Oaxaca is the soul of Mexico. If you want to encounter old Mexico, true Mexico, come to Oaxaca. And you will have lively traditions and beautiful music and the most varied foods and the performances such as Gelaguetza, and you will see the costumes and the crafts and so on and so on. But here's why I say this is not like San Miguel de Allende. In San Miguel de Allende, you have galleries, you have colonial architecture, you have a beautiful city, but you don't have the surrounding communities that make this a life. Like you do have in Santa Fe with all the pueblos and the Navajo people next door. I, perhaps I am romanticizing a bit, but I do think Oaxaca offers what people are looking for. They want to see something different. They want to hear an indigenous language spoken. You see that in the markets. You experience that in the markets. You can buy tortillas that were made by hand in San Miguel. Maybe if you pay a lot of money in the gourmet restaurant, but not in the market, not in the everyday. So yes, it has been a strategy to draw in business, to sell Oaxaca, like it has happened in Santa Fe, but there is a core that remains alive. And that core that is alive, is, I think, is what drew Vera Lee and Jim to Oaxaca and what kept them going. 
and what keeps bringing them back, I, mm -hmm. I would say. You had a question. The color that you display out there, varied of color, which is orange, form of red, with or without the production of Cochito. Uh, does that mean that uh, death is a form of life? Does that mean that it is to be celebrated as the color of the Africa or, or Mexico, it is the color of death. That's my impression from being Would you like to respond to that, Jim? I Did you? The gentleman is pointing to the marigolds, to the orange color of marigolds, yeah. whether it has cochineal or not, and he's asking whether that orange color, the color of death, is to represent Mexican culture, Oaxacan specifically. I never. I don't. I I used marigolds before I even went to Oaxaca uh, as as a source of dye. I don't know if it would. I would almost wonder if it might not be the fragrance of the. <laughs> it was a very powerful, very sturdy flower and it grows so easily. I wonder if it wouldn't be that, I don't know. As an ethnobotanist, I would respond to you by commenting the following. In Mesoamerica, the flora is particularly rich in members of the marigold family, the Asteraceae. The Asteraceae are mostly annuals. They are herbs that complete their life cycle within the year. They come up with the first rains and they complete the life cycle and the end of the rains is October. They're blooming in November and there are scores of species and they're mostly yellow orange. That is the flower that is available in the biggest quantity when you are honoring the deceased. But that date was not indigenous. That date was chosen by the Catholic Church. The Day of the Dead, the 2nd of November, is marked by the Church. It is not an indigenous date. See what I mean? And it is not that the people in Mexico are obsessed with the orange color. Here, it is the one that has become most prominent. But in Mexico, if you travel in Mexico, you will see that people are using the blossoms that are blooming at that time. And you will see orchids that are purple, and you will see stevia, which is violet, and you also see white flowers. It is whatever is in the fields to honor your family, to honor your deceased relatives. So orange is an accident, I would say. Okay? I hope that responds to your question. <laughs> I had the same bus. <laughs> but 40 years ago, I went down there and just fell in love with the place because the people were so friendly. 34 years ago, 34 years ago, we happened to celebrate my wife's 30th birthday at your house. Oh. In, <laughs> in, in Casa Panchita. And we haven't seen each other since then. I don't know. <laughs> But anyway, but anyway, the point the point being is that that, that area of Oaxaca just grows on you. Uh, and those of you that don't know it, you should 
taken in because I have led tours since 83, the Craft and Folk Art Museum tour was the first. And then uh, my last tour to Oaxaca was about, uh, two, about uh, eight years ago. But I didn't see the, the change. I didn't see a dramatic change because what still happens is what happened in pre-European times. The arts and the people are very much the same. Very much the same, and that's the beautiful thing. Mm -hmm. Well, I appreciate what you're saying. Just uh, the magic of driving to all of those villages and trying to decide on which one you want to go to. Yeah. <coughs> and finding them relatively the same. Uh, although my wife and I, three years ago, went to Tlaquiaco, which is a couple of hours, and it, it was decidedly, everyone was on their cell phone. You know, it, it was, it, it had happened there. It was, it become much more, perhaps more successful uh, and so there was a lot more commerce, but very few triques, very few amuscos. It was, it, it, it was commerce is what it was. And uh, I suppose that's a good thing, just not quite so colorful. <laughs> Before listening to another comment or question, I would like to add, and here's where my academic background creeps in. It's very hard to bury it. <laughs> that, what you describe, the community specializing, one in weaving, one in pottery, one in basketry, is again partly a reflection of European history. I can point to what happened in Michoacán, because in Michoacán we have very good historical accounts and documents of how this came to be. It was specifically a Franciscan friar, which we know as, whom we know as Tata Vasco, Vasco de Quiroga, who organized communities in the model of Thomas Morrow's Utopia. He was seeking economic complementary to establish a true Christian community, a community of equals where everybody would have work to bring to each other, and there would be sustainability, not in the ecological sense, that was not a concept back then, but in terms of equity and producing, uh, a, well, the utopia that we have read about. In the case of the Valley of Oaxaca, I, don't know, I do not know to what extent there was this vision that is so clear in the case of Michoacán, but certainly the colonial accounts tell you of the Dominicans, who were the missionizing uh, order in southern Mexico, actively seeking to promote certain lines of work, including Cochineal. Cochineal was actively promoted by the Dominicans. So today we are enchanted with this. We, we think it's a beautiful thing, and it is a beautiful thing, but we have to reflect on the history of it. And part of the history has to do with a vision of a better future based on Western thought of the 1500s, enlightenment. <coughs> but you had a, a comment. Well, I was one of the summer girls, I was one of the older summer girls. And um, when I was there in 1973, a lot of the Mexican people, the mestizos living in Oaxaca, the more educated people, were not interested, it didn't seem as much in Mexican-made things. And they, you know, things were, they wanted them to be imported from France or, you know, there wasn't an appreciation. How did that appreciation come about and when did that happen? Was it, you know, was it partly that it was reflected back um, as being valuable? Because mm -hmm. I know Frida Kahlo and Diego Rivera, you know, were trying to bring that and that was a really radical idea. But to think that a third, you know, a third of the people are local Hawkins and then a third are coming from Mexico to the museums and really appreciating it is a really wonderful thing. So it's that self-regard that's been developed. And pride. Jim is not inclined to respond to it. My sense of this 
is again you have to go back a bit. <coughs> During the Porfirio Diaz regime, which was 1880s through 1910, when revolution erupts in Mexico, for over 30 years, Mexico looked to France. The elite of Mexico was not looking at the United States, not following fashion or even foods here. It was very much focused on what was going on in Paris. The revolt against the regime in 1910, in which my grandfather fought, and the young man that you saw in the picture, Lencho, he also fought. That revolution was a revolution against the entrenchment of an elite that had amassed huge fortune and owned 90% of the land in Mexico and was incredibly corrupt. The revolution turns things upside down and the cultural offshoot of the revolution of 1910 is looking at our past and appreciating this and saying, Europe is not the whole story. Our ancient Mesoamerican culture is what gives us personality among the peoples of the world. We have a unique art we should be looking into and knowing rather than be looking at European models. And there is one beautiful book that I don't know has been translated into English, but the name of it is Forjando Patria, Forging a Homeland. And the author, Manuel Gamio, was an anthropologist who had studied under Franz Boas, if you know the story of American anthropology. Franz Boas came over from Germany and started anthropology in the United States pretty much. Anyway, Manuel Gamio was not only an academic, he was the minister of education for a while. And he was working with the leading politicians coming out of the revolution. And his vision of Mexico was immensely important in turning things around. This is when Folkart gets recognized for the first time. There was an exhibit at the Palace of Fine Arts in Mexico City in the 1920s that you can trace directly to Manuel Gamio and this view of forging the homeland. And it's carried on ever since. First, there was a small group of artists and intellectuals like Diego Rivero, like Frida Kahlo, like Tina Modotti and others. But then this has become the mainstream of the elite. And what you experienced in the 1970s was the transition. I can tell you today, it is looked bad if as a member of the wealthy families, you are not appreciated in Mexican art. I, and I can bear a personal witness, and with this I close because I don't want to, uh, I, don't, I don't want to hold the microphone too long. Uh, we're <laughs> here to listen to Verily and to Jim. I can tell you that I was invited to lecture, uh, not last week, uh, not, not this week, but last week, in Mexico City at the Palace of Fine Arts, which is the most important cultural institution in Mexico. The exhibit that is breaking the records is the Cochinil exhibit. It is called Mexican Red. And the subtext, the subtext is the most important contribution of Mexico to world art history is this red color. Is that the same show that was at the Bowers? No, this is a new show. Totally different, Jim. Totally different. Really Mexican. I mean, really Mexican in reflecting the biases and the ideology of the Mexican elite. This is a different show. It is a response to the Bowers and Santa Fe shows, but done by Mexicans and with a Mexican vision. And as I say, the subject is, this is the most important contribution of Mexico to world history. The exhibit is ram-packed. There are lines going out for over a block long to visit the exhibit. And I was struck because I was allowed, since I was involved in the curatorship and in, I have a chapter in the book that accompanies the show, I was uh, allowed after hours. So I, ha I, I could see the, the exhibit at leisure and I was blown away by a huge group of these incredibly well-dressed, well very wealthy, young Mexican people on a private tour that I had never seen in Mexico before. But this is a reflection. As I say, this is 
what makes us distinct. And so now it is old fashioned if you're gonna be boasting about your European porcelain rather than your Oaxacan ceramics. I, I'm just saying that in the climate of the United States today, I find I'm so depressed. Maybe I'm watching too much news, I don't know, but I don't see the curiosity in our society about where we can be, what, just about global warming or, or to, or as the world solving really very important issues that we all face. Um, that's wonderful to hear that that is. Yeah, it is wonderful, but it is, it is also a response to the yellow hair. Yeah. <laughs>